podcast. Oh, okay. The webinar is now broadcast into everybody. Participants are fill, fill, filling in. I'm excited. Uh, so I'll just, let's give it a, a few more seconds. Sure. The um, participant list is growing like a lot. Should, should we give call outs? I recognize some names here. <laughs> Sure, you can give call out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Will, will people be able to, um, they'll be able to chat, right? So we can look for, for questions. Yes. So. Okay, great. That's right. Um, let me um, share my, my, my screen for a second. Um, and that doesn't work, huh? There we go. Well, welcome everyone to the, um, the Philadelphia in Informs Chapter for Virtual Speaker Series. It's my pl pleasure to um, have Carol. Carolyn Mooney, uh, who is the CEO of, of NextMove, and Ryan O'Neill, the CTO of ne NextMove, to present real-time routing for on-demand on de delivery. Um, they've been working in this field for quite a few years. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's very much of a, um, a, I'm sure that with COVID and nowadays that on-demand de 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 delivery is becoming e even more important. Um, and Ryan tells me that he's going to say that both he and Car Carolyn will say a few words about their background. So without f further um, ado, um, I turn it over to, to, to them. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, I can, Mark. I can share. Um, I think we, you might need to dis to enable sharing for me. Um, I can't. I can't um, share. Oh, by the way, um, I do plan to record this. Oh, yes. Um, so I see. Oops, no, it is re re recording. And to, uh, let's see now, um, panelist. Um, let's see if I need to do something here. Um, you can't re, re, record, huh? I, I mean, I, you can share. Um, right. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm, my problem is I just have to stop sharing. And I use Zoom every day. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I think I need to, there's a setting that needs to be. Uh, toggled. The oh. beauty, the beauty of doing this over Zoom is we can recreate the experience of trying to find <laughs> HDMI cable, uh, which we okay. have. Uh, um, in the let's see if that um, change rule. Uh, um, that's not. Usually, good. there's a little arrow right next to the screen share button at the bottom, and it has a little up arrow and it'll allow you to oh my god i thought i knew everything wow. about, um, <laughs> i apologize I folks no worries You're no on. On. <laughs> sounds good well thank you mark we really appreciate being here and we're super excited uh being based in philadelphia to be a bigger part of the philly informs community so i uh, really appreciate you having us and and excited to give this talk so i wanted you know, as Mark mentioned, I'm Carolyn, uh, this is Ryan, and, you know, we're co-founders and uh, 
see execs at, at next move. And so I wanted to give a brief background on next move as well. So we are a decision automation platform and our tools really help developers uh, quickly automate and optimize problems like routing, scheduling, and assignment. So things that are obviously very familiar within the informs community. And, you know, we're excited to kind of talk about one of those today, which is uh, really the on-demand uh, delivery problem. So context for today's uh, talk, Ryan, if you want to go to the next one. Uh, you know, we're all about, you know, automating these decisions for, for on-demand delivery. So as Mark mentioned, we spent a bit of time doing this at Grubhub and we'll kind of go in a little bit deeper into our backgrounds in a second. But before we do that, I want to give you some context about what we will and what we won't cover. Uh, so we will cover today the basics of kind of these on-demand models. What do they look like? Uh, we'll cover some of the operational challenges. We work a lot with our operations team at, at Grubhub and elsewhere. So to get an idea, a sense for what businesses really care about when they're performing these optimizations. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the technology challenges. So things around, you know, how do we deploy these models, but also, you know, what are some different techniques for solving them? Uh, and then finally, you know, things that we've used to solve these problems in the past and some things that we're using now at, at Next Move as well. So we're excited to kind of dive into that. Some things that we won't cover uh, today are this a, any, any one specific business model. So if you were looking for the secrets of Uber or Lyft, I apologize, we will not have them today. Uh, but we will, we will dive into kind of some of the general characteristics around these on-demand uh, problems. And Which is also... not to say that we don't know them. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely know all of them. Uh, but we also won't cover any specific model formulations. Uh, so nothing about you know, particular algorithms or particular ways to address uh, things. And we also won't go over any benchmarking data or anything, uh, as Ryan says, particularly academic. Uh, he saved all of that for his PhD work. So we will save you that. And so with that, uh, you know, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of who we are, uh, you know, why we are talking to you about this. So my background is actually in systems engineering. I spent quite a lot of time at Lockheed Martin in the beginning of my career doing modeling and simulation work for uh, ballistic missiles and also radar systems. I met Ryan at a small meal delivery startup. You can see down in the corner the logo with the Z uh, called Zoomer. And that was here in Philly. Uh, we were doing meal delivery for collections of restaurants. And we really uh, spent some time at Grubhub after that, um, extending our time there doing decision engineering. And so we, we saw quite a few familiar faces in, in the uh, participant window from that as well. So we spent a few years there at Grubhub. I think in, in total, we did meal delivery for about four to five years. And over that time, really, we learned a lot about the challenges in this space and particularly left to, to build optimization and simulation tech uh, that was more accessible across a variety of verticals. Um, so Ryan, I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit with your background as well. Yep. Um, so like Carolyn mentioned, we met at Zoomer doing meal delivery uh, routing. My ro first role at Zoomer was uh, actually building routing algorithms. Um, so that's where I got my sort of first exposure to vehicle routing. Um, before that, I was at uh, working at MITRE Corporation uh, doing, doing operations research uh, for government. Uh, and before that, I was a software engineer um, doing everything from K Street to the, you know, uh, working in the newsroom at Washington Post. Um, I uh, did my graduate work in operations research at George Mason University, um, most, both my master's and PhD there while, while working um, under Carla Hoffman. Um, and uh, it, it was really through Zoomer and, and Grubhub that I, I uh, developed an interest in routing and, and, and um, sort of a passion for it. Um, as, as Carolyn mentioned, we, we built out the decision engineering team uh, at Grubhub. Uh, that was responsible for everything from sort of forecasting uh, demand to scheduling drivers, um, you know, doing simulations uh, to study region topology uh, and on-demand routing. Um, and, it, and it was through those experiences at, at Grubhub and Zoomer that we, we developed a philosophy of how we think that decisions should be built and how we think that they should be deployed uh, into production software environments. And so uh, while this is, uh, of course, not a sales pitch for our company, um, it is sort of a lot of the thinking um, about how we think in, of, of real-time systems and real-time um, operations uh, for routing um, is, is wrapped up in that philosophy. So we will, we will talk about um, both, both those things sort of interchangeably a little bit. Awesome. 
So the on-demand economy, uh, we wanted to give kind of a context of, of what we're talking about when we talk about on-demand, because um, it can kind of have a couple of different meanings. And so we're really talking about uh, this space that is a lot of familiar brands that you'll see on the next slide. And that is, you know, things like Lyft, things like Uber, uh, you know, even your pet care, like services like WAG uh, and Instacart, like how you get your groceries, how you get your pet care, how you even maybe got your clothes if you're using something like Stitch Fix or something like that. All of these kind of fall into this on-demand economy and it ha they all have a, a certain set of characteristics. So uh, we will go into that in the next slide. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. So uh, we really want to talk about kind of the Uber of X. Uh, Brian and I, during the course of Next Move, spent some time at, at Y Combinator and around a lot of other startups. There's a lot of people out there trying to build the next Uber and you know the Uber of doing some sort of delivery. And all of these platforms basically have the same formulation. So they usually have a set of independent workers. They have some customers that want some immediate service. Uh, they have providers of those services. So those might be restaurants or those might be grocery stores or something like that. And then there's also obviously the business itself, which is the platform to connect them all. And so typically when you see kind of like the Uber of whatever, it's usually somehow in this format. Um, there's a lot of different variations and permutations, uh, but we'll, we're kind of just gonna stick to this generic, uh, generic format. All right. Cool. So talking a little bit about operational challenges, um, Carolyn mentioned that we're not going to go over specific uh, business models so much. Uh, the, the thing that we showed last was sort of a generic business model for an on-demand economy um, uh, platform. Um, you know, if you get one thing out of this talk, I hope it will be uh, a, a deep appreciation for some of the challenges uh, that go with operating one of these platforms uh, and an interest in, in uh, how those uh, specific challenges um, change our view of optimization and operations um, in, in these environments, um, as well as just a sense of, sense of empathy for how difficult it is to do these things in real time. Um, because it, what we see in the on-demand economy is, is both uh, the, the urgency um, and scale that, that almost turned into um, classic logistics, you know, time some order of magnitude. It's, it's like taking all of the operational and, and logistics technology and decision making we have to do and, and doing it um, just on, on, a, on a very large scale very quickly. So there are, there are interesting operational and, and technology challenges to these things uh, that we'll discuss. Um, the way we'll, we'll go through this is uh, just context and examples. Um, so some of these slides will just be setting context for how these systems work um, and context for what those challenges are. Uh, and, and some slides will just be an example of what some of these challenges look like in practice. And, and the, the idea here is I'd like you to be able to sort of get into the mindset of one of these platforms or one of the people sort of operating um, in, in one of these environments um, and to, to sort of think through like, well, what, might, what would this be like if I were, if I were doing this? Um, so one of the first ones here is that uh, all of these, or many of these, these uh, platforms are, are what we think of as multi-sided markets. Um, so if, if you think through the operations of maybe a traditional delivery business or a traditional um, logistics business, um, they have the luxury of being able to sort of plan in advance um, and to be able to tell people what to do. Um, you know, so if, if you want to have a freight shipment, for instance, uh, you know, in three weeks, you contact some provider and they might be able to say, well, no, I actually can't do that. Um, right. That, and that, that luxury of saying I can't do that is something that is frequently not present in these multi-sided markets. Um, what they what the platforms in these marketplaces really, really do um, is is act as facilitators through uh, for the for the other people in those marketplaces. So here we have you know, workers in the marketplace. Typically, these are drivers or couriers or, or something like that. Um, but it could be anything like, a, you know, a masseuse or whatever. Um, and typically, their goal in these markets is to make as much money as possible, right? So they, they sign up to, to get work, to perform that work, and to, 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 to make money. Um, one of the things that might mean, for instance, is that if I'm a driver, I want to consolidate as much work as possible and do it as much and many things at the same time as possible, because if I'm carrying multiple people in my car, um, then I'm making more money in fares. But that is ultimately um, uh, works against the goal of the customers, 
potentially, who want to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. So the, the goals of the people who are working in the platform, the people who are uh, customers of the platform or ultimately serviced by the platform may be at odds with each other. And that's something you see frequently in these multi-sided marketplaces. Um, so typically, you know, you, you've got three or four uh, players in these things and the platform um, is where the optimization lives, uh, partly because it is the facilitator, but partly also because it has the most information. Um, it has some idea of, of where the workers are. Um, it knows what the demand is um, and is able to send messages and pass messages back and forth from everybody in the marketplace. Um, these, these things are hard to optimize. So if you think in terms of the operational models that a platform uh, like an Uber or a Lyft or one of these providers might, or, or platforms might have, um, frequently there are very unique business rules, uh, which are not the kinds of things that you would see in the academic literature. If we think about TSPs or, or traditional route solving, we're typically trying to minimize distance, uh, minimize time, uh, maybe we have like simple time windows, something can happen in a window, but not can't happen outside of the window. Um, and maybe there's a capacity. Um, real world routing problems have all that and so much more. Um, so you, know, you can have uh, break schedules for uh, workers because they are, you know, um, required to have breaks uh, because of their contracts. You can have different kinds of consolidation rules. Um, you can have different rules if you're doing routing where uh, wheelchairs and accessibility has to be managed in a certain way. Um, so it, it's frequently very difficult to, to take some of those business rules and model them using, say, something like a mix integer program, um, or even sometimes a constraint program. Um, the, these marketplaces and platforms tend to be very, very unpredictable. We'll get into this a little bit in a second. Um, but if, you know, in, in the way that we are often trained to do optimization, we sort of know all of the inputs. And those things are sort of fixed and we're trying to optimize the system given these inputs. Uh, but in these systems, those inputs are constantly changing. Um, we do not know when they're going to change and they change in rather seismic ways. Um, you know, so if you think about um, you know, meal delivery in the morning uh, at 6 a.m. versus in the evening at 6 p.m., those are fundamentally different landscapes. Um, if I'm a restaurant, I sort of know when dinner is going to come-ish, but I don't know precisely when and I don't know how big it's going to be. Um, and so it makes, you know, the, these sort of large shifts that occur within 15 minutes, an hour, half an hour, uh, which occur in a lot of these on-demand uh, models uh, can make it very difficult to plan ahead. Um, these problems can get very large. Uh, some of this is an operational uh, consideration, but, you know, typically like thousands of things that need to be done, hundreds of workers uh, to do them is not uncommon um, and it can get very much bigger. Um, and typically in these environments, we have seconds uh, to find high quality solutions uh, that are operational. Um, and so some of the, the techno that obviously informs some of our technology choices in these things. Uh, quick example, um, you know, one, one that is close and dear to our hearts, having worked in this industry for a little while, um, is meal delivery. And so if, you're, if you've never um, uh, used one of the, the many meal delivery services, this is basically how it works. Um, you know, you, the, the fundamental concept is that restaurants are pulling drivers together uh, because if they do that, then they can sort of absorb the variability of, of meal uh, delivery demand um, and use the, the, uh, the set of drivers more efficiently, the pool of drivers more efficiently. Um, so this means that, you know, orders arrive dynamically through some sort of operational period, um, just like they would normally. I mean, that's, that's nothing new. Um, but the shared pool of drivers servicing different restaurants is sort of the new aspect of this. Um, and the ability to, to consolidate multiple orders onto drivers from different restaurants that are unrelated to each other um, is, is the other piece of this that's very interesting. Um, when you look at uh, something like a pickup and delivery problem, um, you know, here we have sort of a, a, a wide range of things that are seen in practice. Um, so these are, these are optimized pickup and delivery routes, just from the literature. Um, on the left, we have a short one, and on the right, we have uh, a long one, um, quote unquote long. Um, so in these, the, the courier, the current location would be the blue dot, uh, the pickup locations would be uh, green triangles, and they have associated uh, delivery points, and then what we have is the opt optimal routes uh, based on uh, whatever the, the metric that's trying to be optimized is. It could be something like total distance, time, or, or error on ETA. Um, but 
as these problems get larger, um, you know, we go from uh, different characteristics where it might be delivering uh, meals, perishable goods, or, or picking up and dropping off people to, to models where we might be doing something like non-perishable goods or, or packages like an Amazon type problem. One of the uh, interesting problems um, that we experience in industry in this is uh, the effect of what we call supply demand imbalance. Um, there are some models where, where all of the workers are gig economy workers. Um, and uh, a lot of the model is about how to figure out who to make an offer to. There are others where uh, workers are scheduled in advance. Um, in each of these models, uh, you have the, 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 the capability of ending up with supply demand imbalance, which basically means you either have too many workers or too few workers um, for the demand that you have. Um, you know, as you get more and more orders to service, um, and you, you don't have enough drivers to do that, what you will essentially see in your, your logistics system um, is that your service levels tank. So you go from being having very good quality of service to having very quick, very bad quality of service very quickly as your, your order to driver ratio uh, go, uh, goes, goes up. Uh, and that, that can happen uh, pretty quickly in practice. So you can, you can go from being properly supplied to undersupplied, you know, in a matter of minutes or hours. And kind of the game a lot of these platforms are playing is how to, how to create that balance. So it usually ends up being like a stream of decisions, like all the way from, you know, scheduling, which is very tactical down to like the operational stuff, which we're talking about here um, in real time. If you, if you think about some of the things that Uber does for its drivers, uh, where it, it says, you know, go to this area where the demand is, they're, what they're essentially trying to do is meet that or match that demand to, to or match that supply to the observed demand or predicted demand. Uh, and so they're just trying to keep these, these curves sort of in check uh, so they don't fall off a cliff or they don't have um, too many drivers sitting there uh, without any work to do. Um, so there's lots of ways that we deal with this in practice in, in operations. One is we just sort of wait and see. Um, you know, demand is stochastic. It's really bad right now, but it could get better, but it could also get worse, right? And, and if you're doing this, you know, as an operator, you might look at the current situation and say, well, it's 7.30, um, you know, typically demand drops off between 7.30 and eight. So I'll just ride it out. That could be a terrible call, but that, that would be a normal thing to do, uh, potentially. Um, you can also add workers. So now you bring in extra supply. How long does it take to get a worker on the ground? Does it take 15 minutes? Are they immediately active? Um, what happens when they come on and you don't have the supply, or sorry, the demand for that new supply? Do you have a financial liability for bringing them on? So those are the, the kinds of decisions you have to make there or things you have to think about. You could just underserve your orders um, and say, sorry, we just have really bad service levels right now, but that's gonna impact your lifetime value. Uh, it might also violate your SLAs. If you have SLAs with uh, the providers as your platform, you might be telling them, hey, we're going you know, to get all of your service done within an hour or something like that. And that, that could negatively impact that. Um, you could try to manage supply with ETAs and say on you know, your, your app or your website, hey, we're, we're undersupplied right now. Um, it's going to take an extra 20, 30 minutes. The problem there is your goal as the marketplace or as the platform is to drive conversion, right? That's how you make money. So now what you're doing is you're just pulling money out of your bottom line. Um, or you could cancel orders or turn off providers. We've seen that happen, but as a worst case scenario. Um, and that's just generally not something you want to do because what you're now doing is saying to your, uh, to your providers, you, know, you just can't operate in our platform right now because we can't handle your volume. And how, how do you think that's going to go um, when you have to renegotiate your contract? Um, so we, we've seen in practice um, that you know, better real-time routing can have very, very uh, big impacts in, in the robustness of these platforms. Uh, and that, so that's, that's one of the reasons that we started looking into this initially. All right, uh, so this is another example. Um, you know, again, a lot of the time when we look at routing problems in theory, um, we usually have a single objective function uh, that we're thinking about, or maybe a, 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 a multi-level, um, or multiple, multi-objective function. Um, but, but in practice, uh, that will not often work very well, um, even within a single platform. So here, ex for example, we have um, New York on one side, uh, just hamburger restaurants that my phone was showing me. And on the other side, we have uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And these are very different operational environments. They're going to see very different uh, variability. They're gonna see different uh, peaks and valleys in terms of demand. Uh, it takes longer to get somewhere in Fairfax than it 
than it than it does on a bike in New York. Uh, so the, the operating environment here is different, as are the ex expectations of the consumers. Uh, so frequently, a uh, one-size-fits-all model uh, will not work well from one operating area or one operating region to another, um, and often even within the course of demand changes within a day or situational changes within a day. Yeah, I mean, one of the examples we had of this, right, Ryan, was that at Zoomer, uh, New Brunswick, which is relatively close to a lot of us here in Philadelphia, uh, where Rutgers is based, there was actually a large, uh, or not a large sushi restaurant in you know, footprint, but they had a lot of volume. And so they were located on kind of like the opposite side of town from everyone else and across a bridge, right? So they had this like physical barrier uh, and, you know, they were not similar to kind of the location of a bunch of the other restaurants, but they drove a significant portion of the volume. So even on like a uh, one day to the next or one month to the next, when we signed that restaurant, like the service levels fundamentally changed because of that region topology changing. Um, and that's something that is just, you know, the system has to be robust to those kinds of changes and, and to identify those kinds of changes early. And, and because if I remember correctly, because they were a sushi restaurant, they didn't really bother to estimate their prep time because they didn't <laughs> no. care about the food being hot when it was delivered to the consumer. And that was yep. just something we hadn't really thought about until we started digging into what was going on with their data and, and with their deliveries. Yeah, everything was ready immediately. Right. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, another example of this is travel speed. Um, this, what, what this shows here is travel speeds from uh, Washington DC taxi data that we fitted to, to different distributions. Um, and what we've found is that even through the course of like one, a single day, um, travel speeds in the city of DC uh, will not only change their parameters significantly, but they'll change the shape of the distribution. Um, it, we, we see this on, a, on, an, on an increasing scale um, especially since COVID started to happen. Um, we've talked to a lot of delivery companies. We've, we've read, read about this where uh, they're, they're just seeing explosive growth and yesterday's data is no longer relevant. You know, if, if, you're, if your volume is growing 10%, 5%, 20% day over day or week over week, you know, what, what does fitting a model to observations in the past actually do for you? Not much. Um, and so their, their operations become more and more real time and more and more responsive to, to, to changes. Awesome. So we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the technology challenges. And so first I want to kind of go through what a common pattern to solve this type of problem is. And so typically what you'll see in a lot of platforms is kind of this uh, division between a kind of assignment and routing. And so the way people will architect this in their software is they'll have usually some sort of service that's doing the collection of the current state of the system. And this will be, you know, what are all the current assignments? What are all the pending requests that are out there? You know, where are all the couriers um, and all of that information. And so that's passed into uh, the model as like kind of a starting point. And then usually, or kind of best practice would be for an, an initial assignment to happen. So basically find an assignment that's feasible and that's kind of in this center column there, find an assignment that's feasible for each of the requests um, and then route the drivers appropriately. Um, and so that might be consolidating a couple, you know, deliveries or a couple people on the same, you know, driver or courier, and that's fine, but you want to make sure that you have a feasible uh, plan <laughs> really quickly, uh, you know, in, in these real time environments, because you have to go operate on something. So you need a plan. And then typically, uh, after that, you will go and try to improve that plan with the remaining time that you have. Um, so that may be, you know, you find this, this first plan in a couple milliseconds. And then that second stage of like plan improvement is happening iteratively for the next, you know, 20, 30 seconds um, in the time remaining that you have. And so this is really important because, uh, you know, assignment and routing are, are decoupled in this framework. And so we think about kind of making the assignments and then doing the lower level problem, which is doing the routing once you kind of have that assignment set. And so uh, if you want to go to the next one, Ryan? Let me, let me just um, briefly mention, uh, so this is not the only model that we, that you see in industry, but this is, I think, maybe the most common Probably one the most common. Yeah. that you see applied both, both in the academic literature on, on real-time routing and, or dynamic routing and, and, and in industry. Um, it also has like very nice 
uh, technological or software aspects to it where you know you, you have a start to a process the process runs and there's an end to a process it makes it easier to to, to manage as a software uh, package yep yeah so what are some of the the challenges here well one uh you know normally the cadence or the sla for this service running is on the order of seconds not minutes uh, or sorry seconds or minutes and not like hours right so these problems are being solved very quickly and have very tight SLAs. They're also not the only part of a process that has to happen. You can think about that platform is not only aggregating that information about the current state of the world, running through the optimization uh, model, right, and coming up with some solution, but then they need to go actually execute on that solution. And usually all of that is happening within that seconds or minutes time frame. So you might be pushing, you know, those assignments out to drivers, drivers may be able to accept or reject, um, and then they have to get back to that next planning cycle. And that can be happening, you know, on a minute by minute cadence, uh, something like that. And so as I mentioned, um, you know, the full like algorithm may not finish in time. So you may not like prove out, uh, you know, run all the way to optimality. And so you have to be able to provide a plan. Uh, you know, it's really important at every stage in this process that there is a plan that you can go execute on because if there's no plan, then you kind of drop the ball on your operations and your operations team is probably going to be calling you and telling and asking you why there are no assignments for their drivers. And so that's not good. And then the other thing is that, you know, every, you know, millisecond really matters uh, because of that, that stream of processes that are happening. And you may have like kind of multiple rounds of optimization that you're trying to accomplish in that same time period. Um, so that time horizon is really important. Anything else, Ryan? Um, I was, uh, you know, th this, the, the time savings matter both sort of in an operational and technological perspective. So, you know, it's, it, it, it cuts both ways. Yep. <laughs> Compute resources are a real thing. Uh, you know, budgeting for those, those cloud computing resources is a real thing. Uh, and, you know, as you start to compile the amount of time that you take using those resources, you know, on a minute by minute cadence in these real time systems, it, it can become quite heavy from a investment perspective for the company. Yeah. If you think about, you know, the, the time that you are not, that you are waiting on someone to, to respond to you, or you are waiting on a process to, to run, um, that is opportunity cost because you could be, you know, using that worker as the platform, you could be using that worker to perform a task. The sooner they finish the task, the sooner they are, are available for another task uh, and therefore the more revenue that you can push through your marketplace or your platform. Yep. Um, okay, real quick, uh, you may know this, this person. Um, this is, I, I'm not on Twitter very often, but this is one of my favorite tweets. Um, I, as optimizers, um, there is sometimes a disconnect for when we study optimization and, and when we between when we study optimization and we, when we apply optimization in, in routing. Um, this is something we've certainly seen. Um, part of the reason for this is that what I mentioned before, where uh, the business rules of these organizations can be very complex. Um, and part of this is uh, the real-time aspect, at least in our case, in the case of on-demand, um, the real-time requirements. Um, you know, it, it can be very difficult to get uh, some existing technologies um, to produce solutions at sort of any scale quickly. Uh, and that sort of is the challenge here. As, as Carolyn mentioned, if you don't have a solution from your, from your solving technology, then you do not operate, right? And, and it's not like that's something that gets better. So imagine that you, you are operating a marketplace, you're, you're pushing orders through it of some kind, um, and all of a sudden your, your optimization breaks down. Uh, that means that you will now have a, a queue backing up of, of requests that may, need to, to be serviced. That queue is getting larger and larger and larger. Your workers are sitting there doing nothing. Um, and so, you know, it, it, these, the, the nature of this system sort of changes the game for what technologies we use when we apply these things. And this is a reason that often people just use heuristics. As optimizers, what we would really like, you know, is to be able to get, to have our cake and eat it too, essentially. Like we'd like to be able to, to, to make good, uh, to, to make good solutions or find good solutions quickly, be able to act on them, but we'd also like to be able to optimize. Um, and so that's, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the technologies that we've started to look into and, and, and um, that, that people have been doing very interesting research in uh, that we feel are appropriate for, for some of these 
for some of these or that have some of these characteristics. Awesome. So the final thing we wanted to touch on is just from a from a technology perspective is really about how we manage and treat um, you know, algorithms in our software stack. And so this kind of gets back to how you know, Ryan and I built out decision engineering at both Zoomer and Grubhub. But we really thought about the space around modeling and algorithms to look more like software. Like we wanted it to look exactly like our software in the sense that you know these things should be easy to build um, easy to test and, and easy to deploy. So that's something um, that we feel really strongly about. And that's and we also think that you should be able to version control everything. Um, the number of times that I was kind of like asked, you know, to recreate a ETA decision like on a given day, you need to be able to know what version of the model you were running uh, to, to, in order to do that. And that becomes like really difficult if, it, if your models are not built with these software best practices in mind. Um, and the final thing is just being able to integrate, you know, with modern uh, stacks. You know, some of the platforms that we've seen out there today, like, aren't necessarily built for things, um, you know, like cloud infrastructure or serverless and, and stuff like that. So that's something that, you know, we really, um, we really felt like well, there was a need uh, when we started next move around. So. All right. So now we'll talk about uh, just some of the promising techniques, or in particular, a promising technique that we see um, coming out of, the, of, of literature, uh, and sort of how we're starting to apply that on that next move. Um, I know that there's at least one person on the call who knows uh, more about the theory of this than I do. So um, I'll, <laughs> maybe I can connect anybody who's interested in that. Um, I'll ask. But you anyway. can also answer questions in the chat. <laughs> All right. Um, so. You know, first let's start. Tar let's let's frame this first by talking a little bit about um, sort of how we got here as optimizers. Um, you know, historically the way that we work and, and still do today, for the most part, um, is is we take some sort of thing, some sort of system, usually a business process that we want to improve or optimize or or whatever, um, and then we translate it into uh, a, a polyhedral representation, uh, which which innately has nothing to do with that business process, right? Like we have a business process and we have a mathematical representation, right? And and it, we as the optimizers are the people that are that are sort of sitting in the middle of this, and and speaking both languages, right? And so this is this is really cool because you know, we have to learn this other language and we get to speak in this other language and we get to think in this other language and it's, it's mind expanding and we get to build algorithms that, that work on these structures. Um, and they're, you know, incredible and um, uh, fascinating things and, and they're extremely performant and uh, some of the, the best tuned algorithms that have ever been written. Uh, but then what we experience um, doing this is that we are sort of gatekeepers. And whenever you have a gatekeeper in a process, what you have is also a bottleneck. And so then we as the optimizers become sort of a bottleneck because we insert ourselves, or I shouldn't say we insert ourselves, but we, we are that translation mechanism between reality and, and desired reality um, and the mathematics of the models, right? The reason I think that optimization actually looks like this um, is that when optimization and linear optimization was first being developed, we happened to have these things called computers that happened to be really, really good at linear algebra. So they could pivot with the best of them, right? Like they could, you, if, you could if you could give a computer a matrix to solve, it would solve the matrix. And so since that was the tool that we had, we applied that, um, that structure to the business th systems that we wanted to optimize, and and therefore was born linear optimization and mixed integer programming, and we we built these incredible technologies on top of those. But but the root is you know that those are the tools that we had. We had that hammer and that chisel and that nail at the time, and so that's part of why optimization looks the way it did, or it does. Um, the downside of this is it's it's the same thing, right? We are sort of drowning in all of this mathematics, um, and. and sometimes it can be hard to tell where the, the purpose or the, the optimization begins and the mathematics sort of ends. Um, an interesting idea that's come out of the hybrid optimiz optimization community in the last 10 years or so, um, you know, is this sort of 
fundamental concept or fundamental truth that optimization doesn't necessarily need to be applied to a matrix. Um, the CP solvers were getting at this as, as well um, a while ago. And it, the idea is, you know, if we think of optimization just in, in terms of sort of the, the major characteristics that optimizers have, uh, which in the hybrid optimization literature, they characterize as search, inference, and relaxation, you can apply these technologies, which are essentially just problem solving techniques to different primitives, right? And so you can, you can swap out that matrix and swap in some other primitive and you will now have an algorithm, an optimization algorithm that operates on something else. Um, and so there, there's been a lot of, um, especially in the decision diagram community, um, this, this um, examination of what happens when we take another sort of fundamental concept and, and swap it into an optimization solver. Um, so like I mentioned, um, we're looking at decision diagrams a lot now. Um, if you have not had any exposure to these, uh, we're not gonna go very deep into them, but just quickly what they are. Um, so if you think about optimization, uh, mixed integer programming, you take out the matrix and you put in a graph, um, you, you're halfway there. Um, a decision diagram is, is a layered directed multigraph um, and it represents choices essentially as a search over states. Um, so if you think of say a routing problem, the state might be, where am I right now? Um, and your transition function would be, where can I go from here? And if you model your problem that way, which actually looks similar to a dynamic program, um, then you can create it into, you can build it into a decision diagram and you can apply a lot of the same uh, fundamental concepts that we have in mixed integer programming to that decision diagram. Um, and what it fundamentally does is, is model that problem as a minimization or a maximization or shortest or longest path problem. Um, one of the nice things about decision diagrams, and this gets back to having our cake and eating it too, is they give us a very natural heuristic for solving problems, which is also capable of optimizing them. Um, and so here what I'm showing, uh, and not to get too, too deep into this, but we have one problem which is called an exact, or one representation of a given problem. Um, this is just from one of the books in the literature, which is it's called an exact decision diagram. This would suffer, uh, and, and we have layers here, which are x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. So we're essentially making binary decisions uh, and we're making them in order, right? So I start at this root node and I make a decision about x1, then I make a decision about x2, um, and my arcs have a uh, cost associated with them, which I'm either trying to minimize or maximize. Um, this would of course suffer from state explosion as I get uh, too many um, options in here, and, my, and my diagram would get very, very wide. So the simple, simplest heuristic that they have for these is just restrict the width, um, you know, and, and choose, choose some subset of these states to explore, defer the rest. And if you're familiar with things like branch inbound, what you can essentially do is apply branch inbound um, to this, this restricted diagram or merged di relaxed diagram. Um, and then you have an optimization algorithm. It's not the same as mixed integer programming or constraint programming or things like that, but it is an optimization algorithm and it is both capable of heuristics and capable of, of optimization. Um, you know, we've seen looking at some of the, uh, the routing problems that we were, we've looked at, um, pretty good results from decision diagrams. Um, what, what this is, is just a graph comparing uh, time to find a good solution on a pickup and delivery problem um, against a, a known model uh, that was high performance and, and used in production. Um, you know, and, and there were times when we were outperforming it by an order of magnitude. Uh, of course, there were other times with different models where we were not, um, but we've seen a lot of promise from these things. Um, and, and part of that is that uh, decision diagrams allow you to model your problem as state, um, and state can be very uh, compact representation, um, and it can be very flexible. Awesome. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of kind of how we are doing this today uh, with Hop. So Hop is our decision um, automation uh, tool set. So I'll go through a little bit of that and then we'll kind of close out, I think, with some questions at the end, right? Yep. Awesome. All right, so model deployment. So we kind of talked about one of the biggest like technology challenges here is actually managing models like software. And so one of the ways you know, we've been tackling this is, is thinking about each of our models as a component in the larger software architecture of a platform. And so Hop really has this kind of defined uh, deployment structure where we take JSON data, so that's like your production data, that's all that's 
aggregated state data that I was talking about before. So like the state of your system from where drivers are located to where all the requests are coming in, all the pickups and drop offs, et cetera. Uh, taking that in as JSON structure, uh, also taking in solver options. Um, so these are things you know that Ryan was touching on with decision diagrams, but like restriction width, stuff like that, um, that allow us uh, to use Hop more effectively. And then all of that like model definition, uh, input output schema, everything like that kind of exists in that model. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we really you know, wanted to make that, that data contract nice, nice and sharp and nice and defined. Uh, so effectively models operate in our system like microservices. And this is intentional because it goes back to the, those principles around decision engineering on like repeatable, testable, scalable models. Um, and that's, that's really good. So, we also wanted to be able to target uh, multiple environments for deployment here. So you can kind of see on the right there, the command line uh, environment, you know, HTTP, Lambda. Um, so have the ability to run kind of in multiple contexts, but switch between them very easily. And so the way we tackle this is the environmental settings or the command line settings are, are mirrored. They're the same. Um, there's, you know, a lot of overlap between them so that you can go from developing on your local machine, testing against local instances, uh, to really shipping this to production very quickly. And that, that's something that is crucial in these you know, on-demand delivery platforms because of all the things that Ryan went over about the state of the world constantly changing, um, especially during times like now, during COVID, where you have this crazy amount of growth, shipping new algorithms and iterative approaches um, is critical uh, to business success. So on the model integration side, uh, this is kind of how Hop works um, at a high level. So I kind of talked a lot about those, you know, production services at these platforms are really creating that system state data um, that's being fed into Hop along with all of those solver settings. And then those decisions are coming out of Hop and kind of looping back through this, right? So that's that iterative replanning process. And Hop um, on the inside, right, has a, a concept of state. And I'll go through a little bit about how Hop is, uh, you know, structured in terms of, of its API and stuff next. But essentially, what Hop is doing is taking that system state, decoding it, adding some like bookkeeping features so that you can keep track of what you're doing as you're searching through that larger state space. Uh, and then it's trying to find the best solution, right? So at the end of the day, that optimization is a fancy form of search. Um, so we're looking for the best uh, solution, whether that's minimizing some KPI or maximizing some KPI. Um, and then on the output side of that, right, we really want to you know, re-encode that information back into a JSON structure that our other services can take advantage of, right? So that those decisions come out um, and are used by the rest of the, of the platform. And so that could be, uh, you know, the assignments are ingested by the driver app, right? And are shown uh, so that they can accept or, or reject those, those requests that are coming in. So in Hop, uh, you know, we've thought, about a lot about like how to structure this uh, using the, that decision diagram solver. And so we have a few uh, things that must happen in order for our models to work. And so these methods are one, uh, we have to define what's feasible, right? And so this is pretty, obviously pretty common in the optimization community. We think about how do you think about feasibility for your model? And the way I like to think about this is just from an operations perspective, what is acceptable? Uh, if you're an Uber or a Lyft or something like that, you're probably, it's probably acceptable only if you have a driver assignment for every uh, rider that comes into your network. Even if that means they're going to be late, you have to have an assignment for them because if you don't service them, remember, we're, we're pushing money away from the table essentially at that point. Uh, we also have a next method. And so next is how we think about constructing that, uh, you know, directed multigraph, right? And so when we think about next, we think about at each layer of that decision diagram, we're making one decision. And that one decision may be appending a pickup and drop off to a particular driver, or it may be making a decision about a price um, and you know, and some price optimization model, stuff like that. Uh, but really that next is controlling how we create that graph. Uh, we also, for any of our minimization or maximization problems, we ha obviously have to have a value. So this is our, our objective function, essentially. And so this is anything that you can calculate on top of your state data. Uh, so, you know, if it's the click to delivery time, right, as long as you can calculate that on top of your data and your bookkeeping you know, model that you've created, then you can use that as your value function. 
And then the last thing is obviously, uh, you know, bounds. So keeping track of uh, what is the best possible outcome from that point in the in the uh, decision tree to like the worst op possible outcome from that point uh, forward. So when you're using those, obviously you're just allowing uh, your optimizer have better information. Any additions there, Ryan? Uh, no, no, sorry. Yeah, I think that actually, um, now that you ask, uh, <laughs> let me go back. Yeah, go for it. Um, if you're looking at this thinking, you know, oh, I could, if I, if I, if I had an interface like this, this is extremely generic, I could put something else on top of this. Like I could wrap a CP solver on top of this or a make general programming solver. Uh, that is intentional. Um, and so one of the, the beautiful things that we just, that we learned when reading about and under, trying to understand decision diagrams was that if we, if we really just think about state as the primitive um, for decision making, uh, so many things map to state, right? And so, so if you build your optimization around that layer, state as your, as your layer, um, you, you, can, you, you have a lot of extensibility on top of it, which is, it, it opens up interesting avenues. Yep. Um, so the, the key advantage is to kind of like both, uh, I would say like the integration aspects and also kind of the underlying technology of decision diagrams that uh, we really think about are, are the ability to make models in this format, right? So that they're, you know, repeatable, testable, interpretable. And we think, obviously, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, models as binary artifacts, you know, all these multiple deployment contexts, right? And the ease of going between them. Um, but one that we didn't touch on a lot was the testability. And so uh, when, when I was at Lockheed and I was doing a lot of like simulation work, like being able to repeat, uh, you know, certain scenarios and understand exactly how, you know, a missile was going to perform or how, um, how our radar was going to perform under certain circumstances was really important to recreate because if you find like, you know, a pathological case that you want to study for, you know, making your system more, more robust, you need to be able to recreate that decision. And not only can you want to be able to recreate that decision uh, for that reason, but you also want to be able to answer uh, to people, you know, to stakeholders throughout your organization. So, you know, the number of times I had folks uh, come to me and ask me, well, why was my ETA like this um, in this system on that day? And being able to recreate the state of the world at that time um, as part of like kind of your output structure is really powerful uh, because then you can go back and you can track your decisions over time. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, basically the, the input and output is, is all production data, right? And like, and you can learn from it. So you can think about building, you know, uh, models on, even on top of just like the outputs. So you can kind of learn, learn what your, your performance is gonna be over time. Awesome. So I think we had a couple of questions, Ryan, uh, in. Yeah, I, we've been typing answers, but I mean, we could also discuss them. Um, yeah. Or if people want to answer, ask more questions, then we can, we can also discuss those. But I mean, I think, you know, the first one we got was, um, you know, what, what's our take on using AI to estimate uh, delivery time and set thresholds for drivers? Uh, some companies offer incentives, penalties for drivers using AI prediction. Uh, this might not be related to this presentation, but I'm curious. Um, yeah, so I kind of got into this a little bit, but uh, but it it is really challenging to I would say use um, predictions of like ETS and like and ETAs generally for um, incentivizing couriers. One because they don't have a lot of control over all aspects of that travel leg, right? There's a lot of variability. If even if you uh, obviously like you you try to route yourself to somewhere across the city um now versus like at 5 p.m on a friday right those are two very different um times right and so there, there's a lot of variability that they don't control but then the other aspect of that is it can create some like a weird feedback loop um and this is because a lot of platforms are actually using their own travel data or their own observations uh, of travel times to generate etas so then if you're using those to kind of generate the eta and then also using that to grade uh, careers, it kind of creates like kind of this weird um, environment. So uh, that that usually uh, is something to think about. And the other thing to think about too is it, there's no guarantee that you will always have all these careers, especially in the gig economy side of this. So you need to um, you know find ways to incentivize careers that are encouraging uh, good behavior as much as possible. Um, but 
I would say often if there are things that are out of courier's control, like that's a very negative uh, view of from the courier pool perspective. So you might lose them to other platforms. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd also say from, from a modeling perspective, uh, you, if you think about the life cycle of, of some request, right? Typically that request is, is made by a person in the customer in the system. Uh, at some point it becomes available for assignment. It becomes assigned by an automated model. Um, a worker picks it up. There, there's a series of discrete state changes that it go th goes through. Um, and depending on the AI model, and I, I'm not an expert in AI, but, but if, if you're trying to fit an AI model to this that is not going to take into account um, this, those state transitions, you may not get very good results. Um, and to be perfectly honest, like nothing beats a good simulation or queuing model for something like that, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, we also have a question, do you have any specific reason for using JSON compared with other data uh, formats for retrieving the data, collaborating with the companies working with JSON? Um, I mean, JSON really has emerged as uh, the, the, the standard for interoperability um, in the cloud. Uh, so for our tools, we, we heavily target, target serverless environments and cloud deployment, deployments um, as well as, as on-prem and things like that. But the way we build them is, is you know, if you can run it in something like AWS Lambda um, or on the edge, then we've essentially scaled down its computing requirements. Um, and so you know, since JSON has emerged as this, this standard for data interoperability between microservices and data platforms and analysis tools, um, that's, that's really why we use it. Uh, I think we have question. a couple of questions on uh, on uh, routing algorithms for a particular network size and how efficient they are, computational time, and also uh, you know the size of problems we can solve using these these techniques and any idea of the ETA variabilities. Um, with, regard, with regards to the question, okay, so please introduce some efficient routing algorithms, including exact heuristics, meta for routing uh, with sufficient time. Um, I, let me just give you a couple of references. So the first reference that I posted there was the paper online vehicle routing the edge of optimization in large scale applications. Um, it's a good paper and it also will have has a bunch of good references in it. There's also a vehicle routing book by Toth and Vigo, uh, which has an entire section on dynamic routing, uh, which is I, I, I think it's the probably probably the best source for, for references in the space. So I would, I would just look there. Um, you're going to see a lot of different models that are like problem specific, um, but you'll, you'll see a lot of like general, like you'll see a lot of recurring algorithms or recurring characteristics to those algorithms. Yep. Well. Um, we also got, are they, are, are they considering traffic situation in real time? So uh, there are quite a few different approaches um, to consider to handling, I would say like transit information uh, in real time. So often uh, I would say like the, the normal providers that you would use as a consumer become too expensive at scale. Um, so there are, you know, some real time uh, platforms that, that folks might use depending on the size of the problem. But sometimes when these problems become really large, it becomes advantageous for a platform to actually generate their own ETAs or their own travel time estimates. And so typically what they'll do there is use their own um, observations of things like speed and location of, of careers to kind of build, uh, you know, models on top of, um, so predictive models on top of that. And they're using that um, to do their estimates. We've also seen that, that sometimes using uh, lower fidelity estimates for planning purposes is, is acceptable as long as you get the same output in terms of a decision. Um, so both of those things. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Ryan. No, I think that that's good. Um... I'll move on to the next one. What language do you write most of the routing algorithms in? Um, we're a Go shop. Um, we like Go. Uh, <laughs> we will eventually support other languages with integrations, um, but our, our strategy is that we want uh, more adoption from software engineers. So we're adopting languages that appeal to software engineers and are used more by software engineers. Um, so I would say something like JavaScript would be appropriate for, for the kinds of tools that we're building and eventually maybe things like Python. Um, I've written routing algorithms in C++, Java, Ruby, Python. Um, you know, you can, you can really write them in anything. Um, it it kind of depends. We, we were using Ruby for a while with his heuristics um, at Zoomer, and then we had to, to, to stop 
and uh, we did have some performance issues with that. Um, but that, it took us a while to, to actually have performance. You can do a surprising amount um, with a dynamic language um, that is not statically, that does not have static compile type checking. But at some point, you you, have, you, you need that efficiency. Uh, so the other one, when routing, do you look at possible future demand uh, and supply scenarios? Uh, <laughs> Uh, one should depends on how good your forecast is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, we had we had a boss once who we won't name who, who uh, once asked us why why do we forecast, um, and, and the reason that he asked that was um, we were in a situation where we we didn't have much visibility into the future where fitted machine learning models were not really able to tell us much, um, and so the thing that he was getting at was make my systems more robust to these uh, to these changes. Um, and so there, there's some interesting uh, literature on the multiple scenario approach, which you may want to look at. Uh, if you just Google for that, I think there's a paper by uh, Bent and Van Hendrick, uh, and then a paper on um, online stochastic combinatorial optimization, which what they're essentially trying to do is, is create solutions that are robust to uh, change. Hi, folks. Um, it's just after set. 7 p.m. Um, can we just do a couple more mi minutes of questions and then um, I'd like to um, f finish up? Sure. Yeah, yeah cool. absolutely. Looks like we have a, a few more in here. So um, um, we have one about how do you properly handle the evolution of your in the moment planning decisions under all the uncertainty inherent in these dynamic systems? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> Hi, James. <laughs> Do you want to take that one, Rooney? <laughs> no, you can take it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's unfortunately that's the answer that I have is 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 uh, projecting forward. Um, and I, I haven't seen anything yet that's that's better. Um, is you know assume things are going to go wrong, um, run the algorithms on them, and it will. If you do enough of this, so so one of the things that's nice about state mechanics is if you. You, if you model your input as a state, um, you can copy that state very cheaply, and you can, uh, you know, run, modify it, and then and then run your optimization on lots of different states. Um, so this gives you a very nice technological method for, or software method for, for um, sort of projecting worst case scenarios or projecting changed scenarios um, into the future, yeah. and then aggregating them and just deciding like, you know, if if I'm doing all these projections and my optimization keeps telling me you know, give this order to this driver, then that's probably a really good idea. But if the optimization in all these different scenarios is really, really uncertain and, it, and you're getting a lot of variable performance on that order, then maybe it's not a good idea. Um, but I'm sorry, yeah. I don't have a better answer to that. <laughs> Something we looked a lot, of, a lot at, at the, in the simulation world, at least at, at Lockheed was looking at like uh, exactly what Ryan's saying, like almost like consensus in uh, approach. And I think that is something that is is really interesting to think about because if you can you know slightly permute the state, it's almost like it's effectively almost like simulating, uh, but it's just a very very low fidelity simulation uh, version. And so I think that that's like an interesting approach. Um, do we want to do one more, um, maybe the one on computational time? Sure. Okay. How do you limit the computational time or final solution quality? Um, you know, yeah, so this is one of the things that led us to decision diagrams um, in, I, I can talk about, I can talk about Zoomer because Zoomer is no longer in business. Uh, the way Zoomer worked uh, was we would warm start uh, from the previous solution. And so if you think about a routing problem where you're routing every 30 seconds, and then we were routing every 30 seconds with a 25 second um, uh, a timeout. Um, not that much has changed from one iteration to the next. You have some new orders, your drivers have changed location, but it's not like the entire world or entire history has been rewritten, right? So you have a lot of information from the previous optimization that you ran. And so we found a huge benefit from taking that solution. And again, this is, this is where state mechanics become really nice because you just update it with the current state, right? Like I've received 30 seconds ago, I ran, you know, an optimization routine, I got a projected state out of it, I got some recommendations. Between then and now, I've gotten a few more pings from my drivers, so I have updated locations on drivers, but not all of them. 
Um, and I've gotten a few more order requests and I've gotten maybe a few uh, delivery notifications and things like that. But that's, that, that state transformation is a fairly easy thing to, to manage and something you have to be doing anyway in these environments. Um, yeah. And so, so starting from the last solution and then you know, optimizing from there, uh, which is just warm starting, um, is extremely valuable and, and it, can, it can get you these sort of solutions. It's, it's almost like where you're continually optimizing, which is good. Yeah. The problem is if your state goes away, you have to start from scratch. And so then you have, a, then you have an issue, but most and of the time it's great. I think it's also from like a tech perspective, it's also really important to just like have a timeout, like what we were talking about before about having like a reasonable solution after a certain amount of time is super important. Um, and also not letting, uh, the, from an operational perspective, like sometimes the fully optimal solution isn't uh, isn't necessarily like that valuable. You could be like on like a razor's edge and like kind of fall off on either side um, if you if anything changes. And the reality is that something is going to change. <laughs> um, nothing goes entirely to plan. And so having a a, a solution that that is maybe um, suboptimal, but like but close, but very good. Um, is sometimes better from an operational perspective because it can be more consistent. Um, so sometimes you you will see like operators are okay with like you know five minutes worse on on a you know ETA or uh, five minutes worse on a delivery time if they know it's just going to consistently be that or, or um, you know more robust to change. And and just leaping in one other thing to that, um, someone asked about uh, do we have any customers where avoidance of worst case is more important than average performance? That's actually quite frequent. Um, and so like a lot of people want to optimize for like a P90 and that's not uncommon at all. Um. So folks, one, um, thank you, Car Carolyn um, and R Ryan. Um, it was um, a great, gr it was a great talk. Num number two, since I can't un unmute everybody, it'd be really nice if the people who attended to write nice messages in chat. Thank you. <laughs> and um, the third thing is um, I like to um, plug what the next talk is after I get rid of these screens. Um, just as a plug, we're, we're going to have, have a talk from the Director of D Data Science and M Machine Learning of Comcast, another lo local Philly com company, next month, October 27th. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a, a great talk and, um, and please join. Again, thank you, Caroline and Ryan, and at least I can clap. <laughs> Thanks, and uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, ne nextmb.io. Uh, you know, if you want to talk to us, uh, you know, feel free to, to message uh, tech, tech at that at nextmb.io. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. Uh, we'll see you at the next talk. And thanks, everyone, for your attention and time and qu good questions. We, we know that there's nothing else going on tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. Bye-bye.